In the previous video, that is part zero of this series, we got introduced to the transformer neural models. We had also glided over the encoder-decoder architecture. Thanks to their parallelization power, many modern neural models can be fed with heaps of data at much higher speeds and wider context windows. But what do transformers eat anyway? In this video, we'll discuss the input that gets fed to the transformer encoder. We'll start with basic input processing, then move on to the embedding layer, and finally to a very important concept of position embeddings. Let us understand these concepts better by creating a fun dialog completer using transformers. We feed our model the first half of thousands of incomplete movie dialogues, and it learns to complete them by generating their second halves. Let us pick one example dialog to make things more concrete. Given my obsession with the Game of Thrones, how about we train a transformer to complete Cersei Lannister's fa famous dialogue when you play the Game of Thrones, dot, dot, dot. So the first step towards any machine learning is input data processing. As decided, the input in our case is going to be the first half of Cersei's dialogue. However, computers don't understand English language. The only language they understand is that of matrices and numbers. We will therefore have to transform the input text in that language. So as to do that, first we take all the words present in our training data and create a vocabulary dictionary out of it. If our training data is as big as a whole Wikipedia, our vocabulary can be composed of all the words in English language. Next, we assign a numeric index next to each word. And then we pick only the words that occur in the current input text. Therefore, what gets fed into the transformers are not the English words, but their corresponding indices. Let us denote each index with the letter X. And that's it. We're done with processing the input. Next, these inputs are passed on to the next layer. That is the embedding layer. An embedding layer 2 has an index for every word in our vocabulary. And against each of those indices, a vector is attached. Initially, these vectors are filled up with random numbers. Later on, during training phase, the model updates them with values that better help them with the assigned task. Now, I've chosen word embedding size of 5 so that they fit my screen. Just to let you know, the original transformer paper, on the other hand, went with the embedding size of 521. So what are word embeddings? Well, these are just vector representation of a given word. Each dimension of the word embedding tries to capture some linguistic feature about that word. These could be things like whether the word is a verb or an entity or something else. But in reality, since the model decides these features itself during training, it can be non-trivial to find out exactly what information do each of these dimensions represent. Graphically, the values of these dimensions represent the coordinates of the given word in some hyperspace. If two words share similar linguistic features and appear in similar contexts, their embedding values are updated to become closer and closer during the training process. For example, consider these two words, play and game. Initially, their embeddings are randomly initialized, but during the course of training, they may become more and more similar since these two words often appear in similar contrast. This is when compared to the word such as caterpillar that often appears in a whole different context. And so towards the end of the training process, their graphical representation may look something like this. Hence the embedding layer selects the embedding corresponding to the input test and passes them further on. Let's denote these embeddings by the letter E. Well, that's about it. As a recap, the embedding layer takes input indices and converts them into word embeddings. Then these get passed further on to the next layer. So let us move on to and visit the final component to be discussed in this video, the position embeddings. But why do we need them? Consider this. If a LSTM were to take up these embeddings, it would do so sequentially, one embedding at a time, which is why they're so slow. 
There is a positive side to this, however. Since LSTMs take the embeddings sequentially in their designated order, they know which word came first, which word came second, and so on. Transformers, on the other hand, take up all embeddings at once. Now, even though this is a huge plus and makes transformers much faster, the downside is that they lose the critical information related to word ordering. In simple words, they are not aware of which word came first in the sequence and which came last. Now, that is a problem. Here is why position information matters. Consider this piece of text. Even though she did not win the award, she was satisfied. Now consider another piece of text that contains the same words but with slightly different order. Even though she did win the award, she was not satisfied. Notice how the position of a single word not not only changed the sentiment but also the meaning of the sentence. So what do we do to bring back the word order information back to transformers without having to make them recurrent like LSTMs? For starters, how about we introduce a new set of vectors containing the position information? Let us call them the position embeddings. We can start by simply adding the word embeddings to their corresponding position embeddings and create new order aware word embeddings. Simple enough. But what values should our position embeddings contain? How about we start by literally filling in the word position numbers? So the first position embedding has all zeros, the next has all ones, and so on. Will that work? Not really. Adding the position information like that may significantly distort the embedding information, especially those of the ones that appear later in the text. For example, if the text has 30 words, the last embedding will be added to the huge number of 30. We don't want that. What if instead we added fractions? That is, if the text is composed of four words, our position embeddings can simply represent word position as fractions of the total length. That way, the maximum position embedding value will never surpass one, right? That doesn't work either. This is because making the position embeddings a function of the total text length would mean if the sentences differ in length, which they often do, they would possess different position embeddings for the same position. This may, in turn, confuse our model, and we don't want that either. Ideally, the position embedding values at a given position should remain the same irrespective of the text's total length or any other factor. So, what should we be doing? Well, the authors of the original Transformer paper came up with a clever idea. They used wave frequencies to capture position information. Here is how they did it. Let us take the first position embedding as an example. Therefore, the POS variable in this formula will be zero. Next, the size of the position embedding has to be the same as the word embeddings, and so it is set to be five and is fixed. This is represented by the letter D in our formula. The letter I here represents the indices of each of the position embedding dimensions. Now, if we plot a sinusoidal curve by varying the variable indicating word positions on the x-axis, we will get a smooth looking curve as shown. So let us go ahead and plot a few of our position embeddings. Now, since the height of the sine curve depends on the position on the x-axis, we can very well use the curve's height as a proxy to word positions. Since the curve height only varies between a fixed range and is not dependent on the input text length, this method can help us overcome the limitation previously discussed. There is a problem though. Note how the position embedding of the words at position zero and six are exactly the same. Even when ideally, they should be different since zero and six are two different positions. This is where the next variable in the equation, the i comes to the rescue. If we plot the curve again at different values of i's, we get a series of curves of different frequencies. Now, here is the idea behind having curves of different frequencies. If two points are close by on the curve, they will remain identical at higher frequencies too. It is only at much higher frequencies that their y-coordinates on the curve differ and you may be able to tell them apart. 
For points further apart, on the other hand, you should be able to start seeing them fall on different curve heights quite early on. Therefore, both the position as well as the embedding dimension can inform us of the word order. Let us make this more concrete by looking at an example. Suppose we'd like to read the position embeddings for words at positions 0 and 6. Now, if you read of the value of the position embedding at position 6 and at dimension i is equal to 4, at lower frequencies, you will find it to be exactly the same as that of p0. These will start to differ significantly as you go to dimensions corresponding to higher frequencies. And so the final vectors at each position can be very different. Now the authors did not use only the sine curves, they used a combination of sine and cosine formula. If you want to dive deeper, there is an awesome blog reference in the video's description that explains the rationale behind using both sine and cosine curves. For this video, however, we'll skip those details. For now, all you need to know is that the authors of the original transformer paper use alternative combination of sine and cosine curves. That is, at odd positions, they use the sine formula to get their position embeddings. And at even positions, they use the cosine formula. Here is what the position embedding curves can look like when plotted on a full scale. So as to get the value of a position embedding at a certain dimension, you can simply read it off the chart. Awesome! So now we can just go ahead and add these position embeddings to our word embeddings and that is it. As a recap, we saw how the inputs get converted into word embeddings by the embedding layer. We then add the word order or the position information to these embeddings so as to get the position aware word embeddings. In the next video, we will discuss the most important part of the transformer neural models, the multi-head attention layer that utilizes the concept of self-attention. So let us fly to the next video for it will be quite a ride.